both the Industrial Revolution and the political revolutions that happened in Europe uh, dramatically change uh, everything, politics, society, uh, the economy, um, and in the long run are actually going to be quite beneficial to uh, the European continent, uh, especially the Industrial Revolution. Uh, the political revolutions were somewhat disruptive and caused a lot of damage, but in the long run, ideas of you know representative government and um, nationalism especially are going to work in, in many European countries' favors. Uh, you know, France, Germany, England, nationalism is going to be a positive force. Uh, what this creates is an uneven balance of power. Uh, economically speaking, the countries that are industrialized have a major advantage. Uh, and in terms of the political revolutions, uh, you find that ideas of nationalism, while quite useful for Germany and quite useful for France and Italy and some of those other places, are actually more of a threat in some of these large land empires, the Ottomans, the Russian Empire, and uh, in China with the Qing Dynasty. And so we'll talk about each of these land empires and, and how they sought to deal with the, the dramatic changes that were brought about by the dual revolution. So starting with the Ottoman Empire in, in the Middle East. Now we had talked about uh, some of the things that had led to the weakening of uh, the Ottomans previously, but um, what you find is that uh, some of the Ottoman sultans, uh, the absolute rulers, realize the positive benefits that some of these changes can, can have, but the Ottomans are going to have uh, fierce resistance from traditional institutions. Uh, the most fierce resistance is by the military, uh, the Janissary Corps, and the uh, clerics and religious scholars, um, two things that the sultans want to do, Sultan Salim in, in particular, is to reform the military in the way that European militaries are, are created now, and that is you know, systems based off of merit and, and using European military technology, and also to reform the law, to institute something like equality before the law, Napoleonic's code, uh, Napoleon's code, rather than applying to something like Sharia law. And so you know, the sultans effort to try and reform these institutions, both the military and reform the legal code, get stark resistance from the Janissaries and, uh, and the religious clerics. And in the case of Sultan Salim, who attempted to do this, uh, he will be captured and executed for his, his effort to do so. Um, you also have other problems working in the Ottoman Empire as well. Nationalism becomes a big problem. The Ottomans were a multi-ethnic, multilingual empire, um, but feelings of nationalism are very strong. And so while nationalism could help France come together behind French nationalism, it actually hurts um, the Ottomans. So two examples are uh, Serbian nationalism in Eastern Europe. Uh, Serbians are Eastern European. They're Slavic. They, they use the um, Greek alphabet. They're Orthodox Christians, whereas you know predominantly the Ottomans are, are Muslims. And so people who share all those similarities, the language, the culture, the history, the religion, uh, will come together and uh, fight back against uh, the Ottomans. We see this in the independence of Greece in 1830. This comes at the expense of, uh, of the Ottoman Empire. And so you have a lot of these areas that are breaking away. Egypt as well, you know, Serbia, Greece, Egypt, all of these territories are breaking away, and it's the inability of the Ottomans to have a military solution for this. Now, eventually, the situation between uh, the Janissaries and the Sultans reaches a point where the Janissaries are uh, you know, simply going to be destroyed by the Sultan, that their opposition to these European-style reforms results in a violent clash between the Ottoman Sultan and the Janissaries, and ultimately uh, seeing the Janissary course uh, demolished and, and instead a European-style military uh, instituted. Um, and maybe the most significant reforms to try and take place in the Ottomans were the Tanzimat reforms. And the Tanzimat included a number of, of different reforms. Um, you know, public education, so you know, rather than you know, religious scholars and clerics dominating um, school, you saw a, a new legal system, Sharia law only applied to family matters and a more secular law code be in place. And and maybe perhaps the most significant, a constitution that would limit the, uh, the sultan's power. And there were a lot of people in favor of the Tanzimat reforms, you know, the constitution specifically limiting. One thing that was also true, and you saw this in Europe as well, is that these Enlightenment ideas didn't necessarily stretch to, to women either. In fact, uh, one of the reasons why you had many people supporting the constitutional reforms was because 
the palace women, those that were very close to the sultan, um, were disliked because uh, many people felt that they had uh, too much influence. And so the constitution and, and some of the reforms is also not just designed to uh, limit the power of the sultan, but also limit the power of, of some of these palace women, whether they were concubines or the sultan's wife or whoever may have the sultan's ear. Um, and so these, you know, these efforts, it's, it's a step in the right direction, you could say, or at least the desire is to uh, uh, reform for the positive. Um, but even the Tanzimat constitution uh, will be suspended by the sultan. And so the sultan will continue to rule as an absolute ruler. And those ideas about representative government by the people for the people uh, don't fully come to fruition. Um, in the 1850s, the Crimean War breaks out. It's a war between Russia and the Ottomans. Uh, this was mostly to settle the Eastern question, which was you know, who controlled the borderlands between the Ottoman Empire and the Russian Empire. Um, the Crimean War is a war that demonstrates a couple of things. First and foremost, it was a check on Russian power. Following the Napoleonic Wars, Russia was perhaps one of the most powerful and influential countries. They were the ones that had stopped Napoleon in his tracks, and many believed that they were militarily the strongest. The Ottomans are an empire that is, they're struggling, and they're losing territory, and they declare war, or, or the two sides go to war uh, with one another. But uh, outside powers are looking on, uh, the British and the French, and the British and the French see this as an opportunity to limit Russia's power. And so France and Britain support the Ottomans, they give them loans, and at the end of the day, it's the um, Russians that lose. A coalition of the Ottomans, the French, and the British team up to defeat the Russians. Now, the effect of the Ottoman Empire, the effect that this has is because of the British and French assistance, the Ottomans are highly, um, highly dependent on foreign loans that British and French and other Europeans will have uh, special privileges, extra territoriality rights. And so, uh, you know, this, this means that even though the Ottomans are, you know, uh, still in control, that in, in some respects they're informally colonized, that it's really European banks and businesses that own the empire. The last group of reformers, the Young Turks, come along and try and uh, institute more reforms. Uh, they're, they're relatively liberal-minded. They want to promote ideas of nationalism, limit the sultan's power. Uh, in 1876, though, that constitution is, is ignored. So the Ottomans, uh, you know, they, they become, in some respects, informally colonized. The sultans still exist, but there are many, many different challenges to power, and it, it goes along the line of uh, this idea of, of struggling to reform, uh, meeting resistance, and, um, uh, and, 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 you know, living up to the name of, of the sick old man of Europe. <laughs>